I'll share a little bit about th this work of Socratic dialogue, uh, but as you'll see as we get into this afternoon, um, I'm not going to be doing any more talking than introducing this because these philosophers, all right, will be introducing the session, will be facilitating these sessions. Uh, but, uh, and, and I will introduce them. Uh, but I'd just like to welcome our principal who's with us, Lisa Atwood, because she's really spearheading, along with our other co-principal, Amy Rex, um, some tremendous school transformation efforts. This, um, I think you all know that um, we're all in the trenches together when it comes to personalized learning and trying to figure that out and figure out what's going to work for our school and within meeting the laws that we have to meet. And I think when we talk about personalization, um, we're no different than any of you at Harwood, any, than any of you are. Um, we're working hard at it, we're having our challenges, but the one thing that we're really excited about, and I think you all would be too, is when you really get to identify and see the personal, the student ownership in the process. And this Socratic method really brings that to the forefront. Sure. That. So um, that's kind of Harwood's way, one piece of figuring out what personalization is and how that impacts instructional strategies and instructional practice in the classroom. Because that truly is the challenge when we get right down to it. It's how do we change what we do in the classroom to impact student learning in a more personal way. Yeah, okay. So let's have some fun. Um, but it became very clear to me um, that learning from the ancients is one way to move forward in terms of working together to seek a deeper meaning of an issue, to seek deeper meaning of text. And, and the way to do that is really uh, um, is to flip the traditional classroom. The, the real the fun and the energy in the learning comes when we change that and we really try and work to ask the right questions not focus on the answers and I started to use this in my classroom at, at Harwood and we these guys are all members of a group of a club called Socrates Cafe we're inspired by the work of Christopher Phillips some of you may have heard of him uh, he is a professional philosopher and what he does is he travels around the world and asks timeless and timely questions and gets people to talk about things that really matter. One of my common lines that you've heard me say is, what if we talk about things that really matter? What if schools were places where you really wanted to be? What if you could learn to express yourself and learn from others instead of being told what to do? Wouldn't that make school a better place? Right? So that in my personal practice and, and in the culture of our school, that's one thing that, that we've been working on. And I, we were lucky enough that we brought this philosopher, Christopher Phillips, to Harwood last year. He did some teacher, he did some training sessions with teachers. He ran some Socrates cafes uh, for the community. So in our work, we've been doing these Socrates cafes for seven years for the community, we've had anywhere between 60 and 130 people come and have these sorts of discussions like we're having today that are run by students, facilitated by students. Because it's about that deep learning to seek, to seek meaning and working collectively. It's learning together. And we have some seniors who are with us. I, I want to make a, a special note of, of a couple people. The reason why we were able to start this club at Harwood is because of this young woman right here. All right, Nina Scalar. Because she came up to me, she said, can we do this all the time? <laughs> right, so we started this club and uh, we have people who've been seniors, right? Seniors, raise your hands. All right, so seniors have been doing this for a long time. They're very experienced. They know how to facilitate these conversations. Juniors, we've got some juniors here, so this is really like in their second year of doing this. And then um, 
We have any sophomores? Yes. So this is wonderful. So we have some sophomores um, who are just learning how to do this. But, but uh, we are what we repeatedly do, right, says Aristotle. So that this is a technique of teaching and learning and working together that takes practice um, and is immensely fun and interesting. So I'm going to step back uh, today and I'm going to be walking around and just observing these conversations. Um, and these guys are going to be facilitating the conversation. So a couple of things about what we do at Harwood. When we meet um, for Socratic Dialogue, and we're having another one for the community on the 24th of May, and I bet we're gonna have 100 people there, um, is we generally either come in with a timeless and timely question, or when we work together, we choose a question. That's what we're gonna do today, all right? And Anna and Jacob are gonna take over and gonna facilitate the choosing of a question. But these are the sorts of questions. This is, this is our list, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm just, we have the whole list of questions that we brainstorm. A timeless and timely question is something that grabs us in the moment, but is, but is eternally and unendingly fascinating and can be unpacked. So these are some of the ones that we talked about. Why do we lie? How should we live? Is it possible for any action to be completely moral? Pretty interesting. Is it ever morally justifiable to commit murder? Is disappointment our own fault? Did we do that one? Yeah. We did that one. We need to check. And then we check off when we've done these. This is an interesting one. Are illusions a necessary part of life? So the, we come up with a group. We come as a group. We come up with these questions, and then when we meet each week, um, we decide which one we're going to talk about in the moment. Just as today, we're going to come up with a list of questions, and we can decide which one we're going to talk about. And each week, we come up with more. We can only talk about one, but we keep a list. So they're unendingly. Uh, uh, there's an unending list of fascinating questions. So this is the one which is, well, I hope we can talk about this one by the end of the year. This is what's Cole's question, right, Cole? Is, is our understanding of the world limited by our language? These are examples of timeless and timely questions. So we're going to have an opportunity together to to discuss some important questions people can bring to the table. What I think is going to be fun is that you're going to get to hear students' perspectives. You guys can hear the perspective of the important people on all these sorts of things. We're all in this together. So we're committed to at Harwood. Um, two is student voice. Really listening to student voice. And this is a model that really celebrates all the voices. Everyone comes to the table. Everyone is equal. So just a few things to remember, and then I'm going to turn it over to two of our very highly skilled facilitators. A dialogue is working together to seek a deeper meaning. None of this is none of us is as smart as all, all of, us. of us. Right? A dialogue is different. A dialogue is probing, all right, and seeking deeper meaning to learn from comments that we bring to the table. So one of the things that we've been practicing is how do you ask a probing question? How do you ask a clarifying question? How do you go deeper into a text or into a question? These are these critical thinking skills. A dialogue is not necessarily about talking. It's about listening and responding, not reacting. These are schools, these are skills that I don't think we teach enough. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Jacob and Anna. They've also um, been invited and have gone up to 
People's Academy in Morrisville and taught a class for students up there and how to run Socratic dialogue. So they're going to open this up in terms of, can we choose a question to talk about today? And then when we do, we'll, I'll, we'll come back and instructions as to who can go where. All right, so like Kathy just said, I'm Anna. I'm Jacob. Um, and so essentially our role right now is to help us come up with a question for discussion. So what makes a good question? A question should not be able to be answered with a yes or a no. Yes, um, it should really be open to uh, multiple different answers and multiple different perspectives. It should ideally lead to more questions. You should leave here maybe a little bit confused with something to think about. At the end of all of our Socrates cafes, I always walk away knowing less about what I, or <laughs> knowing that I know less about what we were talking about that day. Mm -hmm. Which is an important reminder sometimes. Um, so just like take a couple seconds and think to yourself, about what you've been wondering about in your life. Um, maybe it has something to do with education. I don't know if we're sticking to that theme exactly today. Um, but is there anything that sort of made you wonder? Have you been curious about something? Have you noticed something in particular that stood out to you that you want to ask other people about that you think your own knowledge could be enriched by other people's opinions and perspectives? Um, yeah, so just take a couple seconds and think. Um, and if you have one, there's no hand raising, so if you have something, if you have a question, just speak to us and we'll write it down and at the end we'll all vote as a group on what we're going to speak about. I have a question. <laughs> um, so, I guess I'm, I'm more interested in the interactions as well between kids. Like how, how well do students, are, are, do you feel like you're kind of regionalized? Um, or do you feel like you, you kind of move about and have a greater understanding of, of all the different students and their backgrounds in Vermont? Mm -hmm. That's a really interesting question. Could we ask something like, um it, like how can we know all of the different students in Vermont or yeah. something a little bit more open because asking sort of what are the similarities mm. and differences you could easily make a bulleted yeah. list yeah. and unfortunately that is far too concrete okay. <laughs> so yeah so what do you think so, yeah is there a way that you can make it broader in a sense can you just repeat the last twist do you remember what you <laughs> what you said to me last um, I think I said is it possible to know all of the different, I guess, like facets of people in our state, something like that. Yeah. Or what are the, no. Because that's a list again. You want, yeah, you want yeah, to avoid just, specific you stuff. Know. You can't actually, you, know, you don't want to find any answers to this stuff. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what does it mean to know? Yeah, how, how, would you, how might you know the, the, the makeups of the different students, that's a horrible. I'm not a <laughs> uh, Yeah, I kind of heard earlier you were kind of saying like, what does it mean to be a Vermont? Do you think maybe we could expand on that somehow? Or like, like what are the different yeah. meanings of being a Vermonter? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, well, that's better than, no, not better than. <laughs> I think it's more in line with where I was going with then, what, yeah. what does it mean to be a Vermonter? Yeah, yeah. I think I have a, cl a clear sense that I am not a Vermonter. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> that sense. Uh, yeah. So yeah, more like, what are the what are the different definitions of a Vermonter or a Vermont student? Yeah. yeah, you could go even more specific if you're thinking more along the lines of youth. You can, I think it wouldn't be too specific to say youth. Especially if it sounds like you wanted to explore some of the different influences maybe on a student in Vermont, be it location or um, know other defining factors in the state there's a second part too that I'm curious about which is th the interactions between students of various regions and how much you get out of your regional lines and how aware you are of others outside of your particular region does that make sense yes 
And while I do understand the question, I don't think it's exactly the sort of question to be asking in this um, sort of discussion and setting. I'm, I'm so failing horribly. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm really, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so just some more transparent works. facilitation. <laughs> <laughs> um, because it, it, this is a skill. The type of, it, this is a dialogue, and it's different than question and answer. It's different than a debate. And it's different just, different than hanging around and talking about stuff and asking questions. We say, um, what's the diamond of your question? What's the gem here? What's the essential part of this question? And how can we phrase it so that it can be unpacked? Maybe if other people have other questions we want to throw <laughs> up, and then you can be thinking about that. Don't, don't stop trying. You're approaching proficiency. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> school system or education system that is meaningful and purposeful. That's beautiful. What is the essence of a meaningful education? Yeah. Okay. That's, that's, that's what you said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Turn over a rock on your patio and it's just pull out the gold. <laughs> possible for a teacher to apply to or um, like appeal to all different students and their types of learning and if it is how can they do that? Okay. Is there a way you can shorten that <laughs> a little bit? Um, uh, I need some help with that. <laughs> Maybe like is it possible for a teacher's learning style to be applicable to all students? Is that kind of what you're saying? So maybe, maybe how engage all students. Yeah. What kind of teaching teaching style engage or apply to all students? Is that how can a teacher engage all students? Yeah. 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 Could the word transformation influence systems change? Change. Mm. So could you almost expand that to say like sort of, I don't know, what are the different types of change or what does the word transformational really mean? Yeah, what, yeah. Like, what does transforming education really mean? So that is, uh, what is the essence of a meaningful education, and what is the highest or most virtuous um, uh, purpose of education? So yeah, so we'll go ahead and vote for uh, this one. What is the essence of a meaningful education? So looks like six. <laughs> no one's heard of that. All right, and then for, uh, <laughs> I think that's pretty, pretty well said. Yeah, so our question today is what is the highest, uh, most virtuous purpose of education? Time. Yeah. All right. Is that a timeless and timely question? <laughs> yes. yes. All right. Are these guys not good at it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So just in terms of time and of, 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 of spaces, we thought when we counted, we have about 34 people. We have 14 students, and then we had 20 people. So we have 34 people, so we thought we'd divide into three different groups. And generally, the way we do this is we have two people, two individuals who work together 
kind of this co-facilitators. Because what we generally do is we sit in a circle. We don't usually have tables. To protect you. <laughs> right. Um, so, um, facilitators. The first thing, when you go in, right, like we usually do, share some names, we have name tags, ground rules for the session, what we talk about, and, and, how, and how we speak, and you guys know what those are. So do you guys know where to go? Group one's gonna be in here, group two's gonna be with Nina and Olivia, and group three with Harrison. And then we'll count everybody off, one, two, three. How does that sound? Sounds good. We can do this, right? On your mark, is that? One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. What? Two, three. One, two. Two. Three. One. Two. Two. So, just to begin, um, we'll go around and say our names, and then we'll go over a few just sort of baseline guidelines for the discussion. Um, so, you want to start, Jacob? Sure, sir. My name's Jacob. Rick. Pat. Libby. Bob. Anna. Sophia. Jacob. Katrina. Linda. And Catherine's going to come join us in a second. Um, so a few things to remember about this discussion. Um, it's been a while since you've all been in school, but this is not school. You don't raise your hand to speak. This is a free, um, really safe space to say anything that you're thinking. Um, so you don't have to ask for permission to do that. Yeah, however, with that said, we do need to make sure that we're not interrupting people and still letting one person talk at a time and same old stuff. Yeah. So... I feel like you probably can all handle that. Yeah. Um, and that's pretty much it as far as things go. You don't, want, don't you know, directly attack people. That's not nice. As Kathy said before, this is not a debate. This is a dialogue. So. We can just get right into it then. Get into and, it, yeah. yeah. Um, so our question. What is the highest slash most virtuous purpose of education? So. You guys can just say what you think, really, and we'll just get into it. And remember, this silence is not a bad thing. Just take your time to think. Don't talk just to be heard. So my first thought that came to my mind was something around social justice. And so if we're talking about virtuous, it's how do we, how do we um, create educational opportunities so that all people can reach their fullest potential regardless of tags that we put on them. What I liked about that question right away was the, the notion of highest purpose and virtuous so it it took me to a place well past like skills and competencies and I was thinking that well how does that connect to mankind and people um, the ultimate purpose being the care of one another and uh, how would you create environments where that really came to fruition as the ultimate purpose and I was struggling I'm struggling still with the word virtuous that we don't often talk about outcomes of education as virtuous. And I think that's important. So how is that different than maybe some of the um, other ways that we've talked about outcomes for students? Who gets to define it? I, you get a different definition of that for different mm -hmm. people and regions? And so can there be one most virtuous purpose, given that virtue is something that one could argue is really an intensely personal thing. Well, I know for me, virtue wasn't really a word that I had heard until um, last year through Democracies with Kathy, actually. And suddenly we were talking about this word virtuous and um, what does it mean to be virtuous? And it was just a word that I hadn't really heard before. It's kind of for me, it's kind of this, you know, this very shiny, almost unreal, perfect word. And sometimes it's startling to hear it because it like almost feels like it doesn't have a place in everyday life. The platonic ideal. Yeah. 
Yes, yeah, so I was talking to someone earlier today, actually, and um, they were saying how it would be so interesting if education were approached where um, people who taught the youngest of our society were paid the most, because really that's laying the foundations for who we are going to become as a society. Um, and you know, like virtue is something that starts in a person very, very young. Like you, like it's it's something you learn. It's not an innate skill by any means. So, I just thought that was a really interesting way of thinking about it. How it's really sort of the opposite of a way it could be potentially better. I don't know, but that was just interesting to me. That makes me think differently. I'm. I'm struggling with the word education versus being educated. So what is the highest, most virtuous purpose of being educated is an easier question for me to grapple with than education as a system. So that's one thought I have. And But then off of what you were just saying, the people who educate our youngest learners are their parents. How can society do a better job of supporting the people who are with our youngest learners first? your mind made me go in a different direction, which is interesting. I would like to think it's to give people the tools they, they need to make the world a better place. But saying the word better place becomes very subjective because what someone's idea of a better world is may be very different from what my idea of a better world is. I'm just thinking about current political debates that are going on and, and how virtuous people are trying to be in their ideas and ideals, but they're very conflicting. People don't always use truth in virtuous ways, even though it's a virtue. This actually does get me thinking even more, because I'm, I'm, you know, going through the whole college thing and, you know, um, but it's it's definitely just in these past few minutes I've definitely just been thinking um, you know like why am I going to college a lot of people are doing it so that they can get a good job so they can make more money um, I'm doing it because I, I just like learning stuff I just think that's fun um, and I want to do more of that but even that isn't necessarily what I would deem virtuous so that's just a thought that I'm having. Sort of virtue implies a, a, a purpose. Um, maybe not a higher purpose, maybe a practical purpose, I don't know. But there's something um, that's more deliberate to that word. I, I was thinking, you know, we struggled a lot in education in the 80s and the 90s, this whole notion of. <clears throat> schools didn't have any business talking about values um, that was a family's responsibility and so you know back to this virtuous purpose could I wonder could you be selfish and virtuous simultaneously or are, the, are those inherent contradictions and so for me I'm thinking about developing an ethic of care and caring takes you beyond yourself so the virtuous person is not satisfied with their own self-aggrandizement, their own development, that wouldn't be sufficient. And so what does contributing, giving, helping others grow, what does that look like and what's your responsibility? If you said, I don't want to be virtuous, um, I didn't sign up for that. So. I wonder if that also made me think, I guess the, the, the resume versus eulogy, like is your goal like if you're thinking about your eulogy and what you would want that to look like, even though you can't really, you're not really going to see your own eulogy. If you could, what would you want it to look like? Would you want it to read like a resume, just a list of your accomplishments, or would you want it to be something different, something more, something more um, subjective? And I don't know. It's just I haven't really thought of. Keep expanding that. on that. Keep expanding on the like second part of that thought. Yeah. Yeah. I guess. I guess there's your personal accomplishments, which would be the resume side, but then the other side is everything that you've given other people, 
and the way that they think of you and the way that they think of your kind of place in their own lives and how, I don't know, how that looks and how that would look different from person to person. And I think transforming that thought kind of towards education, like as a teacher, do you want, like, how do you want your students, like, did, did you serve them the purpose of, like, getting the stuff to build, like, a strong resume, or did you give them, I don't know, their, I don't know. Like, did you get your content across, or did you make them better people, yeah. almost? Because I feel like a lot of times the job of a teacher is to do both. It should be both, in my opinion. And the teachers that I always remember are the ones that shaped me more than just teaching me how to do calculus. So what can teachers do to make better people? Like asking me or everyone. <laughs> Throwing it out there. That's a cool thing. Let's, I mean, I think definitely look at that. Like what can a teacher do to make a better, to make you a better person or their students better people? Though it isn't just the teacher doing that. Mm -hmm. Certainly not. Mm -hmm. There's a question I thought of that may connect into this is, what is the difference between a student and a teacher in an educational system? Do you have any thoughts on it? Ideally, the difference is as small as you can make it be because students need to be responsible for the education of other students as much as teachers do. And I think that we should de-emphasize the importance of the teacher as a source of knowledge. Um, but, you know, achieving the type of end that I think we're talking about here really does, is students are going to be the product of a system as much as the teachers are going to be a product of the system that they're working in. So I don't know how much you want to have to distinguish between the two. Well, I like full and in, in, in coherence. One of the things that he says that I've loved so much is not talking about teacher as content leader or teacher as facilitator, which is what we like to say, but it's teacher as activator. And, and the teacher's role is to activate spark thinking. And then once that thinking is deliberate and has to spark it again. And how do you, how do you step in and step out and step in and step out with kids continually activating their brains in a way that is meaningful? I like that idea of teacher's activator. Yeah, I've recently arrived at a similar conclusion just from being a student that a teacher and a student need to meet each other halfway. They're each giving, you know, I, like I, I don't know, it's almost like um, a convergent boundary of tectonic plates where they, the two come together and that's where they make mountains because they're both pushing on each other an equal amount. Um, because if it's facilitation then it's almost the teacher leaning too much on the students who aren't, they, they don't know enough. And then if it's the other way around, it's a teacher lecturing to students. And I, I don't even think the teacher really likes that, to be honest. And that's how we typically talk about outcomes for kids. No, it's the virtuous piece that makes that a little bit different. So it's not just about having choices. I think going back to what some other people said in terms of making the world a better place for others, so not just being concerned with your own knowledge or um, what you get out of the system, but it's what you put back into the system. Boy, thanks so much for bringing that up. So getting very near the end of our time, we might have like a minute left. Um, so if there's any last remarks people want to share with the group, now is the time. Or we can just be done, which is also fine. This is great to have a conversation with the diversity of perspectives and ages around the table. So thank you very much for being here. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for participating. I learned something. You can say that with certainty. Mm -hmm. I, I just think we, we just have a few minutes before, guess what?
Pot, raise yourselves. We have to go back to school. <laughs> How many people had a good time? Okay. So let me ask you another question. How many of you felt that you learned something today, or that that? Uh, oh, okay. So one of the things that that uh, we think we know about learning is the one that does the work does the learning, right? So this this type of interaction um, is is the type of creating sorts of relationships where um, this is really shifted, where we're all learning, we're all working together, right? where we're searching for this deeper meaning, we're collaborating together, doing this work. Um, and it's really been my joy to um, investigate this. I'm, I'm just really interested in learning and asking questions. And, and, and uh, I learn every single time I get to be with these guys. Um, I, they teach me more than I teach them. Right? I wanted to piggyback on your statement about learning from students. I really appreciated the students um, in our group. And I found that um, the adults in the group weren't nearly as skilled at having a dialogue. We didn't do nearly as well building on each other's comments and thoughts and asking the right questions as the students did. Um, in fact, Evan, I did overhear you saying, thank goodness Cole was in our group, he kept the group alive. Um, <laughs> and it just, oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm always thankful we'll have Cole. <laughs> Everybody always wants Cole. So it just, um, <laughs> Reminded, it just reminded me about being human in interaction with one another mm -hmm. and to leave our assumptions at the door and that the students were more skilled than we were and that's nice to see. I like that. Hey. Well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me may I ask a question of you guys, of, of students. Um, do, do you? Could any of you talk about the process of learning how to engage in dialogue and um, how hard, was it hard for you at the beginning and, and how have you had to, because it takes, it takes practice, uh, about the process of your learning how to, to do these dialogues? Um, for me, I mean, I'm a junior and I, the first time I really got into all this philosophy and um, Socratic dialogue was last year. And so this is really kind of my second year of delving into this type of knowledge. Um, and for me, it's, it's a slow process. Um, I'm not going to lie. It's a slow process. <laughs> but it's, it's, in my opinion, it's definitely worth it. And at every Socratic dialogue I have, um, I even told this with our group, it, it, for me specifically too, it can take a while before I actually join the conversation. And so I'll sit aside and I'll listen but very intensively, and make sure I really get everything everyone's saying, for I can finally, when it comes, I can say something. And for me, normally, it takes, most of the time it's a word. Sometimes one word will actually get me going. Um, like earlier, I think it was Ellen, is that right? Yeah, she said the word culture, and that just, I was off. I was, going, <laughs> I was talking, I was leading into different types of things. And so, it, for me personally, it's, it's a longer process, and sometimes you have some things that can kick you off into what you kind of really want to do. So it's, it, it also just varies with who you are and how you learn, ironically, and <laughs> how you take things in, so, yeah. Um, I found it incredibly challenging because I'm very quick to agree or disagree with someone, and if I disagree with them, I don't, I don't really generate my own ideas of why I disagree. I'm kind of like, no, I don't agree with that. I don't think that's an accurate statement or something. And it, it um, I think this dialogue allows me to be a lot more open to other people's opinions and try a lot harder to understand where other people are coming from. And not only that, but it allows me to have a stronger idea of what I believe in and my own opinions, and it really helps me form and generate a much more educated opinion. Did everybody hear that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was not a solicited comment. <laughs> That's really powerful. That's really powerful. 
uh, and that's why I'm so intrigued by th this very ancient method of teaching and learning, because that's essentially what we're really looking for, right? Um, how can we work in community? How can we engage in dialogue? How can we um, learn to be tolerant of each other? How can we not come to snap judgments, but how can we respond with thought and consideration? One of the things that it makes me think about, see, I think is really important to the question. And one of the things that we've done in the last several years in education is we've talked about the importance of the essential question. But we know that often these questions are not the right questions. They're still too concrete. They don't really lead to real open questions. And then we also just post it on the board, but we never let anybody discuss the essential question in a very meaningful way. You know, in other words, we've gone through some motions, structure and style, but not necessarily deep thinking. So I really want to thank, you know, um, all the people from Harvard because it makes me rethink about, you know, we have some good ideas but we don't always really implement well. I have one um, last request. Could you talk from a student perspective, who, someone who's maybe been part of this process, what was, what was your process of learning to engage, truly engage in dialogue? I can kind of, I've been thinking about that, so. Um, I can kind of answer that. I think what has helped me progress uh, the most has been the opportunity to employ Socratic dialogue in a really diverse uh, spread of situations and with uh, diverse groups of people. Uh, we have the Socrates Cafe that we do at our school that is both students and uh, community members and teachers and then here you know, we have people who are very experienced in education, and then we have some of us uh, worked with uh, local community members on some more specific data that was Socrates, uh, or Socratic dialogue based, uh, and in terms of learning the process and getting really comfortable with um, breaking down some of the school training um, and gaining confidence in yourself, and then also gaining listening skills and learning how to kind of um, ask questions that are directive and have um, some purpose in terms of the arc of the conversation. So yeah, I would just say finding and taking opportunities to employ it as often as possible and in as many varied situations as possible, which is why it's so important um, what Kathy is doing right now. <laughs> And it's different for everyone too, like some people use it as a way to help them learn to speak up more. I personally um, have had it help me to not speak up as much. Um, <laughs> and, you know, for some people it helps them to better formulate their thoughts into questions and others better to formulate their thoughts into answers and really just sort of build off of each other, you know. Everyone is a little, a different puzzle piece and so we can create these really interesting things all together. So I'm curious for those of us who are intrigued and maybe inspired a little bit by today, which I am on, um, what would be or how would we proceed to maybe become more skillful in this method? What would be some suggestions for how we can start really learning more about other ideas? Because when we started this, we didn't know what we were doing. We were just, we, I mean, I, I had an idea of what I wanted to do, but I'd never done it. Um, so I, I really took the, the, the work of the ancients, the Socratics, as my role models, and became a student of the ancients. And, and then uh, there's uh, all due gratitude to Christopher Phillips and his model of Socratic dialogue again he and I, I can give Marilyn I can give you some citations some resources that you might start with because he's written a series of books one is called Socrates Cafe one's called Six Questions of Socrates and and he has a number of he has a lot of materials that we have learned to train ourselves so when we began this work um, 
we were beginners, we're still beginners, but I think what Evan is saying is the only way to practice dialogue is to practice dialogue. And there, um, in some of my other classes, Olivia was a, worked with me for a whole semester and she led these dialogues with a group of kids who are much younger and were much less skilled. And one of the things we did is we had poker chips. He said, everybody's got five poker chips. So you either blow your rod all at once, <laughs> right? Um, or, and then you have to be quiet, or you use them one by one as a way of beginning to teach this for people who it may not come naturally to. So I think, I think this can be taught. Um, so that's one of the things that I'm very excited about next year is, is really um, being intentional about how can we begin to shift the teaching and learning in the classroom, how can we train kids, how can we train teachers. Um, so that's a long-winded answer to your question. I think we have to Go, yeah. say thank you and get on the bus back to school. Thank you <laughs> all so thank you. very much. Thank you.